Good morning. I'm Pastor Park of Onalaska United Methodist Church, and this is our midweek refresh worship service following Sunday, October the 11th. And we've been talking about the kingdom of God, and this week we focus on how the kingdom of God is a party. It's a celebration, and we do have a lot of things to celebrate today, so we're going to get right into our worship service. morning everybody hey kids at home today I do have a cupcake with me to show you and did you know that cupcakes are full of life lessons well we're gonna go through some of those today now when someone has a birthday usually we put what a candle on the cakes or the cupcakes and some people don't like candles because it reminds them of how old they are but it also can remind us that people Life is very, very precious, and all the important people in our lives that we get to celebrate every year. So that's a different way to think about it. Now, a candle isn't much good unless it is lit. We'll see if this, with the wind, if this, what this is actually going to do. Yeah. Well, we're going to pretend that this candle is shining bright. Now the Bible says that we should be the light of the world for others and that Jesus is the light of the world. And we wanna make sure that 
when people look at us, they see Jesus shining right through us every day. Now, on top here, we have this beautiful icy, and it looks pretty yummy and sweet. And that's to remind us that even when life gets hard, we still have sweetness in our lives that we can see all around us and we should be extremely grateful for. Now, sometimes life isn't quite like that. And when I cut this, what, what happens to that icing? Oops, there goes my notes. The icing splits and it's kind of, you know, broken. And that, that's what happened to us sometimes. Our, our hearts can become angry or frustrated or sad. Thank you. And we become broken. Hmm. And it's really hard to still see that sweetness in our lives. So let's move down to the cake. That's the real important part, isn't it? When you look at this cake, I want you to think about if you've ever not liked a cupcake or a cake. Have you ever looked at that cake or the cupcake and on the outside it looks so delicious and you just can't wait to take a first bite and then you bite into it and ew, yuck. For me, that would be looking at this this way and then taking a bite and there's a big hunk of pineapple in it or something like that or a big chunk of peach or whatever. <laughs> so that's to remind us that sometimes things look really good on the outside and sometimes people seem really good on the outside, but maybe their heart isn't so nice. Now we want to make sure that we look like this cupcake and that Jesus is in our hearts so that we can bring his love to all of us around us so that they can also have Jesus in their hearts as well. Now, before we pray, we need to celebrate somebody today. And we are talking about joy today, and cupcakes brings us, bring us joy, but so does our own Pastor Park. And Pastor Park is uh, a huge joy for our congregation, and October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So we wanted to make sure that we celebrated all that Pastor Park does here at the church, and we are so thankful for all that you give us. It, seems like you a cupcake, right? it sure does, and so do all of you. <laughs> so as you leave, <laughs> as you leave today, make sure you stop and grab a cupcake. We have lots of cupcakes, and at home, if you want to come through the drive-through after church, we'd love to give you a cupcake as well, and you can send your wishes to Pastor Park. And um, Pastor Park needs to watch his mail this week because I think he's gonna get some interesting mail from our littlest members of the congregation. <laughs> Let's pray. God, this morning we wanna thank you so much for Pastor Park. We thank you for sending him here to our congregation. We thank you for his leadership, his guidance, his caring for us as a congregation. We pray that you would continue to bless him and his family as they continue their ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hello. About two years ago, when Loretta and I were moving to the area, we were coming from the Twin Cities, and we were in a, a church, Methodist church up there, that happened to be a reconciling congregation. And that was a very important part of our faith journey to be there. And so... At the time, we were a little bit disappointed because when we searched the records, there were no reconciling churches in the Methodist area, in the La Crosse area. And at the same point, though, we became encouraged when we heard that the Onalaska Methodist Church was beginning to start a process to look at whether or not they should become reconciling. So from a God moment perspective, we are truly, personally, as a family, celebrating this major milestone. So I have you, I want you to think about something. When a stranger shows up at our door, how do we react? In addition to welcoming them, which we've done, and this church had that as its part of its vision all along, was to be a welcoming congregation. But now that we've adopted a reconciling statement, We've also pledged to do more. We've pledged to affirm them and to celebrate their gifts. This is a bold statement that we're making to the community, including those in the LGBTQ plus community as well, those people, and the others who view themselves as allies. So 
So with you today, I celebrate this action. Now Park will tell us how we're going to gather to take a group photo so that we can document this important day. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with our reconciling journey, if you go to our website and look for the reconciling tab, it has uh, all of the stories and witnesses that people shared over the uh, time that we spent talking about this and many of the materials we've studied, as well as the statement itself, which I think does a great job explaining that we value the gifts of all people and we welcome them to participate in the life of our congregation fully. So uh, what a wonderful and powerful witness that is. I'm going to sing in the middle of a storm. from Luke chapter 19 verses 1 through 10 Jesus and Zacchaeus he entered Jericho and was passing through it a man was there named Zacchaeus and he was a chief tax collector and was rich he was trying to see who Jesus was but on account of the crowd he could not because he was short in stature so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Bless this reading. So, um, hi, I'm Zoe, and I'll be preaching today. Um, for the past couple weeks, few weeks I guess, we have heard from Pastor Park, um, Paul, and Jessica about the kingdom of God and what that means for all of us and today you get to hear from me um if you don't know me like pastor park said my name is zoe DeBoer. i've been attending church here since elementary school went through sunday school confirmation um, and now i do the, the praise team and i also um, help lead high school soar um, i'm in my final year at Viterbo university and i'm studying theology and i like to call myself a, a baby theologian um, <laughs> I was a little surprised when Paul asked me to preach just because I, I did not um, expect that at all. And I, to be completely honest, like felt pretty underqualified <laughs> because it seems like such a this huge thing to do. Um, but I'm actually really excited to share what I have um, created for you today. Um, so the kingdom of God is like a party and we're all invited. It seems like a weird thing to be talking about in this time of social distancing, events being canceled left and right, all of us being advised to stay home, and if we do go out, we have to wear masks and stay far away from each other. Um, it seems weird to be talking about parties right now, but I think that maybe that's because God wants us to be focusing on something else while we're on earth in order to prepare for the party that is God's heavenly kingdom. In Luke, um, Jesus tells a parable about being invited to a feast. He says, When you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, 
Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. I'm going to read a little part of that to you again. When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Sometimes it seems like partying as a concept is a rather unchristian thing to do, especially in the current day and age. As a 21-year-old college student, the parties that I think of are not what I can see Jesus necessarily condoning. Um, I look out my bedroom window every weekend and see the parties happening uh, in the backyard with the beer pong and the swimsuits in the middle of October, and I don't think I can see Jesus quite joining that. Um, I also don't think I could see Jesus participating in the Oktoberfest that was supposed to be canceled but then happened anyway. Um, but at the end of the day, Jesus did not shy away from parties or feasts or, or large gatherings. In fact, his very first miracle took place in the well-known story of the wedding at Cana um, in the Gospel of John. Jesus is attending a wedding that runs out of wine, and then he had the servants fill six 30-gallon jars of water, which Jesus then turned into not wine, but the finest wine. Um, I pulled out a few stories in the Bible where Jesus partook in large feasts, gatherings, and parties. Um, just for some brief historical context, in case you need a bit of a refresher, which I did, which is why I called upon the wonderful Paul Bratch to help me out. So this is what he said. In Jesus' time, um, he and the Pharisees clashed because the Pharisees became entirely focused on laws and rules and behaviors and not on the heart. Their obedience had nothing to do with love. This obviously contradicts what we all know about Jesus' values. I'd like to think that Jesus values love above everything else. Along with clo associating closely with the Pharisees, Jesus was also associated with the poor, with women, with sick and crippled, and with people in positions that were looked down upon. There's a story told in three of the Gospels where Jesus eats at Matthew's house with sinners and tax collectors. In the Gospel of Luke, uh, Jesus eats at Simon's house and lets a woman, a sinner woman, anoint his feet. There's also the well-known story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, where he was given five loaves of bread and two fish and performed a miracle and was able to feed all 5,000 people that came to see him speak that day. One of my favorite uh, stories is the story of Jesus having dinner with Mary and Martha. Um, so from the scripture, Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. One of my favorite stories, and one that I dug into this past summer with my undergraduate research, um, is the story in John of the adulterous woman. So basically in this story, Jesus comes upon a group of, presumably men, um, threatening to stone a woman to death for being an adulterer. And um, they say to him, Jesus, shouldn't we stone him, or stone her? Um, she, she's a sinner, and he goes, yeah, you can stone her to death if you haven't sinned yourself. And they all go, well, we've all sinned, so I guess we can't kill this woman. And the, I love this story because it's, it's not about what she did. It's about the fact that nobody else has the right to condemn her when they are all sinners themselves. If you paid attention to who Jesus was eating and gathering with in all of these stories, you would notice that Jesus was always with people that were, that were considered to be less than. Jesus, Son of God, the Messiah, the King, could have eaten with royalty if he wanted to. He could have partied with the richest and eaten the most expensive food, but instead he chose to dine and celebrate with those that were rarely invited to the table. So I'm going to ask you now to do something that's a little bit different than uh, sermons here regularly, but um, I know that throughout our lives we've all experienced feeling outcast, feeling uninvited, feeling discriminated against, so I want you to turn to people around you and just share a couple of those instances in your life and I will ask for a couple of volunteers to share um, especially my fellow student friends who I know are good at these partner sharing so I'm going to ask you to volunteer um, so if you guys want to talk amongst yourselves 
about things that have happened to you. Um, because I think it's just important to realize that this is not just something that happens to one population, but something that happens to all of us. So, discuss. I, I guess what when Zoe asked the question, what I think of is being in high school again, back, well, in junior high too, or what they call middle school now, was just the whole thing where people who were athletic, you you'd be told that you're going to be playing basketball or baseball or something. And the, they would divide up everybody, they'd choose captains, and then whoever was the most popular, or whoever was the most athletic, most athletic would be chosen first. And those of us, me, who weren't particularly athletic, wasn't tall for basketball, that sort of thing, would always be the last in line, the last one to be chosen. So I always hated that experience. I think it's different now in school, but um, yeah, that was, that was what I thought different. of. It's not different? I was always the last, too. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so my example was school. So at a young age, I was always frowned upon, whether it was the color of my skin or my mental health. And you know, it sucked, but I definitely think it made me a stronger person because if it weren't for those people, I probably wouldn't be as strong as I am right now, so. Yeah. All right, anyone else? So this one was actually, it was both personal and it was, it was collective, and it's kind of related to today, actually. Um, there's a tradition in our community of uh, a group of churches that get together and celebrate Good Friday services um, the, during the week before Easter. And we've participated in it. I've been active in it for a few years now. And last year we offered to host the service here. They were looking for a, a church to host that service. And I let them know um, that uh, we were in the early stages of our reconciling process. And, and uh, the leaders didn't think that was going to be an issue at all. And then... Uh, a few weeks before the service is planned, uh, we found out it was going to be an issue and that uh, there were churches that did not want to come here or participate with us because uh, we were even considering being an open and welcoming congregation for LGBTQ people. And uh, uh, that, I, I have to confess, that was painful for me uh, to hear that. Uh, uh, and then in the end, COVID happened and we didn't have a Good Friday service at all. So uh, I don't know. But uh, anyway, there you go. Thanks, Zoe. Yeah. Thank you all for sharing. And thank you for humoring me and talking in your groups. Um, so, am I on? Okay. So um, my mom shared something with me about a year ago that I've been thinking a lot about recently. And when she first shared it with me, I was thinking about how it related to me as a high school student as well, um, sometimes feeling left out of groups or hangouts. But over the past year, I've started to think about it in the context of all of the underprivileged populations um, that are in our communities, our country, and in our world. So this is the um, o, o versus U concept, um, which I've adapted a little bit from the original document. Um, circles are great if you're on the inside. They can be fun if you're in, in one, but circles can be awfully cruel if you're left on the outskirts, looking for a way to get inside. They can be exclusive, they can be exhausting, they can be cliquish, they can be childish, and they are far, far too common. Stop building circles and build a you. Leave room for everyone. Make a way so anyone, any you, can walk up and feel like they have a place to stand. Leave room for good people who look different than you, who run in different crowds from you, who like different things than you, who come from different places than you, Differences were never meant to divide us. They were meant to build us and to teach us, to fill in the gaps where our own gifts give way and come up short. Use it to recognize the hurting among you. Use it to recognize the lonely. Use it to recognize the left out. And then use it to, rec to reach out an invite or a hand or some kind of nice gesture. It's not an easy thing to do, getting out of your comfort zone, getting over yourself enough to help someone else, getting your saw and your hammer and your nails right there in the middle of a crowd to build a bigger table. It's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it. We're all guilty. We've all done it at some point. We've all been unaware. So there is no purpose in being mad or angry 
and there definitely isn't any purpose in using it as an excuse to call people names or tear someone down. Chances are nobody is being mean, nobody, nobody is being intentional. Chances are they are simply not thinking, and we've all been guilty of not thinking before. But that doesn't mean it's okay. That doesn't mean we should keep our blinders on. That doesn't mean we should continue constructing our closed off doors. Be the kind of woman, well, so it said woman, but be the kind of people <laughs> that you wish someone had been to you. Make a you. Circles were made to be broken, but yous were made to include everyone, to keep growing bigger and better and stronger. Yous were made for us all. I absolutely love this concept, and it is definitely something that I have tried to incorporate into my personal and social life since I learned about it from my mom about a year ago. But one line sticks out to me, and it doesn't necessarily sit right with me. The text says, chances are nobody is being mean. Nobody is being intentional. Looking around at the current climate we're living in, I have to disagree. There are far too many people who are being mean and are being intentional and not extending the invitation to the kingdom of God. If there is one person who walked this earth who was a master at creating yous instead of o's, it was Jesus. For Jesus always made a place at the table for those that were not typically invited. There is too much work to be done here on earth before we can accept our invitations for the kingdom of God. There are too many people that are hurting, starving, sick, uneducated, crippled, targeted, taunted, exploited. The list simply goes on and on. There's too much of this for me to feel okay about accepting my invitation to God's table without all of my brothers and sisters beside me. One of my favorite things that I've learned at school is from my professor, Sister Laura, but it's something that all three of my religious studies professors tell us often. Prayer is good, prayer is amazing, but prayer alone is not enough. We need to pray for the starving and then go feed the starving. We need to pray for the homeless and then go give them shelter. Pray for those outside of our O's and then build U's so they can come inside. We have been talking for months about how to build a more inclusive congregation, whether that be with our LGBTQ plus community, our African American community, ways to include more youth or ways to be more accessible to elderly people. By going online, we have even opened our doors to people that can't come in person. I know for a fact that my grandparents in Olivia, Minnesota, and all the way across the ocean in the Netherlands watch every Sunday. Hi, grandparents. <laughs> but we can do even better than this. Over the next week, and if I'm being honest, for the rest of your lives, um, I invite you to think about how you can make everyone around you feel welcome and invited. All are welcome in the kingdom of heaven and all are welcome at God's dinner table. If Jesus died with those that were less than with not a second glance, then we should be more, we should be more than okay with doing the same thing. Because what good is facing the gates of heaven without all of our brothers and sisters right next to us? Amen. Amen.
As we continue with our service today, let us take a moment to pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for the invitation that you offer to all, all, to come and to celebrate with you in the kingdom of heaven. You invite us to be hosts of the party, to be greeters, to be inviters, to open our arms and welcome people to come. You don't ask us to be bouncers. It's not up to us to determine who gets in and who stays out. Instead, we are simply called to rejoice. Lord, help us this week to open our hearts and open our eyes and open our arms to all that you invite to your party. Amen. Scripture tells us to rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Friends, it is good to be part of the party of Jesus. And as you go out this week, look for the reasons that we have to celebrate and the reasons that we have to share. As you have been blessed, go forth and be a blessing to others. Amen.